song.
Well, good morning, friends. Delighted to see you here and worship with us today. I'm Chuck Wilson, and I'm one of the pastors here at Matthews United Methodist, and we're thrilled that you've chosen to be with us on this uh, Sunday of the Memorial Day weekend, the year 2022. Now, normally at this point, I would say take that little card that you received when you came in and fill that out. But we don't have any cards this morning for you that were distributed to you. So do, do us a favor, if you can, go to that QR code that is there on one of the uh, little places in the pew. And you can click on that and, 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 if you will, register your presence with us, especially if you're a guest with us today. We'd love to just be able to connect with you and to say thank you for coming our way. Our nation is weighed down by grieving hearts over the last couple of weeks because of tragedies that have occurred in Buffalo, New York, and Laguna Woods, California, and of course, now one of the worst school tragedies in the history of the United States in Uvalde, Texas. And I'm sure that we all can share a pretty broad range of emotions, overlapping emotions, including things like sorrow, and outrage, maybe despair, confusion, perhaps even fear. Jesus' primary emotion, as the biblical writers would tell us, was compassion. But that emotion never stood alone as just a mere feeling. The gospel writers give it to us every time that this would take place, were, and they were quick to point out that Jesus experienced compassion, and then there was something in response to that emotion of compassion. Jesus had compassion and healed the sick. Jesus had compassion and fed the crowds. Jesus had compassion and raised the dead. May our compassion in the face of such gut-wrenching loss move us to greater kingdom action. Now the contrast of this weekend's holiday is really unmistakable. Memorial Day celebrates those who served our country more than self and their sacrifice was a source of protecting life and their dedication furthered freedom instead of abusing it. May God heal our fractured union through deeper levels of community and may God protect our children through greater actions of love. And now if you would friends I want to invite you to stand as you're able all across the sanctuary as our bishop for the United Methodist Church in Western North Carolina, Ken Carter has written a beautiful prayer of lament for us to share together this morning. And now, if you will, friends, let's pray this prayer together. Almighty God, our prayers rise like incense. When we cry out to you, the Psalms teach us you answer. The massacres of the innocent in Buffalo, in Laguna Woods, in Uvalde are known to you. Our schools, our churches, our supermarkets are pierced by violence, racism, and hatred. We sit now in the darkness of yet another grief, and we cannot be complacent. We are our sisters' keepers, our brothers' keepers. We pray for those who have lost so much. We pray for those motivated by a culture of death. We pray for the anger that we harbor within ourselves. And as we pray, we know that we can and must act. We name those who have been murdered. We seek the development of sane gun laws. And we honor governmental leaders with the courage to enact them. And we commit ourselves to the way of Jesus Christ, who is our peace. 
and who has broken down the dividing wall of hostility that is between us. He is our judge and our hope. Come, Lord Jesus. May our swords become plowshares. May our killing fields blossom into a garden. Guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. Please be seated. We have a very, very special treat for you today because there are suffering people not only in this country, but today we also remember suffering people in Ukraine. A few weeks ago, we gathered for prayer here at Matthews uh, in the town green right in front of the town hall, and we prayed for the people of Ukraine. And that evening, we also heard the beautiful and haunting music of a mother-daughter playing the violin. Yelena and Diana Mushkovsky playing a Ukrainian song. I want to ask us now, if you would, to just in the spirit of prayer, receive this beautiful music. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you both so much for being here, for playing that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful music. Um, just want to, don't even know what to say on a day like today because it's very heartbreaking, but um, we're trying to set the tone of reverence, set the tone for uh, asking God for forgiveness. If you will stand with me as you're able and sing, this is a holy water. May his uh, forgiveness run over us like holy water. knees. 
talked about earlier we added this next song called dear hate and it was written in 2015 by Marin Morris after the Charleston mass um, shootings and even though the song is called dear hate it really is a song that not only talks about the hate that's in the world but that love and hope will always prevail and I don't know about you guys but at the end of the day sometimes that's all I have to hold on to is just love and hope. Dear Hate, I saw you on the news today. Like a shot that takes my breath away, you fall like rain, cover us in drops of pain. I'm afraid that we just might drown. Dear hate, well, you sure are colorblind. Your kiss is the cruelest kind. You could poison any mind. Just look at mine. I don't know how this world keeps staying. Garden, like a 
like a snake in the grass. I see you in the morning, staring through the looking glass. You whisper down through history and echo through these halls. But I hate to tell you, love. Thank you so much, John, too, for that as well, reminding us that love will conquer all. And for all those at home, we want you to know that we love you too. If you'll wave at the camera, say we miss you, we wish you were here with us. Turn to that neighbor next to you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Take a moment to greet your neighbor. Let me add my word of greeting to that of Pastor Chuck. I'm Pastor Paul Craig. It's also my privilege to be one of your pastors this morning. And today I get the, the great privilege of lifting up a couple of prayer concerns from our larger church to each of you. And first comes from our Global Impact Ministry team who ask us to pray for the Matthews Help Center. They have a need for gently used summer shoes and sandals to sell at their Black Porch Treasures and loose change for their cash register for their cash-only customers. Each week, it's our pleasure to pray for another congregation within our larger community. And this week, we're praying for St. John Newman Catholic Church. For these and the concerns that you bring before you, would you lift them up now before God? Let us pray together. Holy God, we come before you in prayer this morning. 
we lift up to you the joys and the concerns, the hopes and the dreams of our lives. May we also be open to your voice, that we might see with new eyes and hear with new ears the direction you would have us go. We thank you for your word that declares Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that he bore our sins on the cross, that he reconciled us with you forever, that he satisfied your justice, that he appeased your righteousness for our evil, that he rose as proof of our justification and our future glory in your sight. Bless, we pray, this gathering of your people, that we might grow and flourish in your love and grace for the purpose to which you have called us. Hear our prayers for those whose lives have touched us, those who are in pain, who are ill, those who grieve. We especially ask for your healing touch on those who are suffering, grieving the loss of life, the loss of innocence, the loss of all sense of security in the aftermath of the actions experienced in Buffalo, Uvalde, Laguna Woods, and the ongoing war in Ukraine. May we touch their lives not only through our prayers, but through our lives and our actions as well. Guide us this day. Bless us. Uplift us and hold us on this Memorial Day weekend as we remember and we give thanks, honoring all those who served and died to protect our freedoms while serving the military. May we never forget their sacrifices for our country and for the freedoms we take so much for granted. We come today as your children, loved and called to your purpose in your world. Hear our prayers, those that are spoken and those that remain hidden in our hearts. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord who taught us when we prayed to say together with great confidence these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a couple of announcements this morning. I'll add also a word of welcome to not only those of you in the sanctuary, and as Pastor Chuck said, if you'll look in your bulletin to the, the QR code there and scan that, you can print the bulletin at home. You can also find everything that we mention here through that same QR code. If you're with us online, let me welcome you and invite you to check in from the homepage on our website. And there you can access our Friday Celebration News, which has all the events and the details and the announcements that you need to have this week. To also let you know that our next Path Forward session is next Sunday, June 5th, in the Commons. There will be two sessions, one from 9.30 to 10.30, and the second one from 10.45 until 11.45 a.m. Our presenter is the Reverend Amy Coles, the assistant to our bishop, and she'll provide updates for us on the protocol, postponement of the 2022 United Methodist Church's General Conference, and also our continued commitment to the United Methodist Church. Also, we hope you read the letter from our church leadership that clarifies a number of bits of information concerning General Conference. It was in our email correspondence this past week, but if you missed it or would like a copy, there are copies available today at the Welcome Center out and to my left. Our Global Impact team is also collecting items for the Matthews Free Medical Clinic. They'd ask that you bring your pencils, copy your paper, scotch tape, and business-sized envelopes. Drop them in collections bin that you'll find outside the chapel in the hallway, and also you'll find them in the breezeway. This morning, we invite you to light your candle for worship if you're with us online. And friends, let me lift up also the fact that as we continue to uplift this church in the community, in our region, and indeed throughout the world, there are a number of ways that you can continue your commitment to this place. First is to visit give.matthewsumc.org. You can text Matthews to 73256 and follow the link. You can use the QR codes in the pew pockets and click on the Give tab. And of course, as always, there are giving envelopes there in the pew pockets. You can use those to leave cash or checks or any other things that you'd like to leave for us. And as always, please take note of the Joash chest that always sits underneath the communion table as a reminder to each of us of the commitment we made, hard to believe, but almost nine months ago. It was for this year into which we're almost in the middle of already as summer approaches. So we will send those back to you in the fall so that in the safety and the sanctity of your own home with your family, with whoever you share it with, 
but also a matter of time with God and with you to see where you are and where you intended to be. So thank you again for all you do today. It makes all these things possible and more. So friends, as our ushers make their way forward, would you sit back now and enjoy this beautiful song of offering. When the best of me is barely breathing When I'm not somebody I believe in Hold on to me When I miss the light the night has stolen And when I'm slamming all the doors Yelena, thank you so much for playing with us all through the morning and things. And Yelena, just for you all to know, I don't think we've said this, but uh, there's a fella right back there. His name is Dimitri, and I think Dimitri is your brother. Isn't that right? Yay. So our very own bassist is uh, brother, and uh, I think we even have mom and dad down here, and we're just thrilled to have you all with us today. Leonard Bernstein, when he was the conductor of the New York Philharmonic, was asked some years ago, what is the most difficult instrument to play? Now, before I tell you how Bernstein replied to that question, I want to 
ask you what you think might be the most difficult instrument to play. Some might say it would be the, uh, the violin as you were playing today. Some might say it's the French horn. Uh, some might say it's the organ that Kathy White plays for us in our first and third services so wonderfully week after week. But Leonard Bernstein's, his comment didn't mention any of those instruments when he was asked what's the most difficult instrument to play. Bernstein said with a wry smile and with a twinkle in his eye, he said second fiddle. Now, perhaps there weren't many of you thinking that he would say that. But, you know, I think Leonard Bernstein is so right. In the orchestra of life, there are very few instruments that are as difficult to play as second fiddle. In fact, every one of us in this place today, if we're absolutely, totally gut-level honest, we would have to admit that sometimes in our lives we have played second fiddle. I wonder if there might be anyone here in the room that grew up with a brother or sister who perceived, uh, you, you, that you might have perceived or was perceived as the, the, um, the favorite in the family. I mean, they got all the good things before you did, you know, the money to go to college, Maybe it was the tuxedo, maybe it was the gown, maybe it was the car, and you were always playing second fiddle while they were first chair violinist. I mean, anybody in this room grew up in a family maybe like that? Maybe, maybe a, a, if you're a parent in the room today, then you know what it's like to play second fiddle because parenting involves putting your, uh, the needs of your child above your own needs. It's ironic when you think about it that children, when they're young, they're clinging to their moms and dads, and there will come a day, though, when they'll push you away, and these parents will have to learn how to play second fiddle. One of the more difficult transitions in all of life is is for an older person who has cared for and loved so deeply all of their life, suddenly that person is the one that is in need of care, and it's not easy. I mean, it's also not easy to watch your mother or your father or your grandparents not be the same as they used to be. And your picture of them is always that they were so robust, so full of energy, and then you realize they're not the same as they used to be. And that's a very difficult transition to make. And sometimes it's hard to play second fiddle when you have to put the needs and the interests of aging parents above your own. I wonder if there may be somebody in the room today that has had to play second fiddle maybe in business life or vocational life. If any of you ever done, you know, some of the work or at least most of the work while watching someone else get the credit for it? I mean, did you find yourself playing second fiddle maybe at a time when you prepared that speech or that report for which someone else got all the praise or perhaps you were the one that had that number one account and the top client in the, in the firm used to belong to you, but now they're being serviced by someone else and you find yourself relegated to playing second fiddle. I have a hunch this morning that many of us in this sanctuary could tell stories about playing second fiddle. Leonard Bernstein was right. Second fiddle is without question the most difficult instrument to play. But to play it, and to play it with quality, that is very, very rare in our world today. And it's going to take a quality that we just don't find in abundance, especially in our nation. It's that good, old-fashioned virtue called humility. Now make no mistake about it, you're going to need humility to play second fiddle. Now I believe that God's looking in and through this sanctuary today, that God is looking for women and men and children and youth that are willing to play God's instrument of second fiddle. And again, make no mistake about it, in God's 
orchestra not only is second fiddle the most difficult to play, but it's also, friends, the most important to play. For God wants us to play second fiddle in his orchestra, not begrudgingly, not with oughtness, not with resentment or even bitterness in our lives about it, or feeling sorry for ourselves. This morning, God wants to instruct us on how to play second fiddle and to do that joyfully, voluntarily, meaningfully, so that second fiddle can come to life. Because when second fiddle is played with the humility and to the glory of God, then the echoes and the sounds of heaven are in it. Now, many people consider John the Baptist perhaps as one of the most uh, important second fiddle players of all time. I mean, people came from all over the world to hear John the Baptist. He was this tough, common sense, no-nonsense kind of preacher, but without question, one of the greatest of all time, and it was a tribute to his preaching and his teaching that so many came to hear him, even as if his admonitions and his things that he was saying were difficult to hear. There was nobody like him in the world. And some began to whisper, saying, well, maybe he's the Messiah, but John the Baptist the Baptist knew he wasn't the Messiah and that his role was to play second fiddle and prepare the way for the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. John the Baptist played second fiddle without resentment, without bitterness, and without feeling sorry for himself. Do you remember what he said? Remember those words? He must increase, I must decrease. But the maestro, the master, Jesus, really the greatest second fiddle player ever, I think it was the Apostle Paul that says him of him in Philippians chapter 2, and I paraphrase a bit here, that Jesus, who had the right to be the first chair violinist in God's orchestra, willingly played second fiddle so that he could turn second fiddles like us into first chair violinists. And this morning, God's looking for people who would be willing to play second fiddle, to serve others with humility, and to joyfully play God's harmony. Now, I think about that passage for today, it identifies, I think, three characteristics of what it means to play second fiddle. And I want you to ask yourself this morning as I walk us through them, am I one of those persons whom God is choosing right now to play the most difficult instrument in the world? Characteristic number one, people who play second fiddle are in tune with themselves. Paul says it, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Not long ago, I was at the grocery store, and I, I had only two items, but I was behind a bunch of other people in the express line, and I looked over, and I saw a woman with a basket overflowing with groceries, and so I thought to myself, well, maybe I could get through faster by getting right behind her. So I went over, and I stood behind her in line, and as I did, with my two items, she looked up at me, and she smiled, and she said, young man, why don't you go on ahead of me? Now, I loved it because she called me young man. And then she said, I've got this basket full of groceries here, and so why don't you go first? I, I, I'd love to have you do that. And friends, in that little exchange between uh, that woman and myself, I learned a great deal about her. I learned, first of all, that she had such good taste when she called me a, a young man, but more importantly, that she was a woman of worth. Because you see, a person who doesn't know their own worth would say, well, I was here first. 
And I'll be darned if I'm going to let you, an old codger, go ahead of me. I have the right to be here. I mean, do you see what I mean there? It makes a big difference, friends, when you know that your self-esteem comes from God and you know your worth and you can let other people go ahead of you. But please don't misunderstand me today. I'm not calling for us to be doormats in this world. Far from that. Because, friends, because we know our own worth, it is a call to celebrate the others around us. Now, the Bible is replete with stories of people who couldn't celebrate the people around them. Remember in the Old Testament, King Saul was one of them. The story goes that young David, the shepherd boy, was a, was a young man of great charisma, and he was a, a, a one that was ironically so devoted and loyal to the king, and I believe David was sent from God to be a gift from God to King Saul and to make King Saul's life easier. But when they went out to battle with the Philistines, King Saul, the Bible says, killed thousands. But David took the slingshot and killed Goliath. And when they arrived back home, there was a party and there was a celebration. And the women came out with timbrel and brass and they sang, Saul has slaughtered his thousands and David his ten thousands. And the Bible says that Saul eyed David from that day on. There might be a business or a corporation here in Charlotte that where a bright young person is starting to move up the corporate ladder and perhaps you're in the room today and you're feeling a little bit, uh, you know, threatened by all of that. Or maybe there's a firm that's got this superstar and it's all set to take your place. So let me tell you, if you can celebrate those rising stars with your sense of self-esteem and God's love, then that may be God's gift to you. And maybe you'll be God's gift to help teach them some things to help them make their way along by God's grace. Because it's not about climbing the corporate ladder or whoever has the most toys wins. It's not about any of that. In God's kingdom, there's a different kind of music. Any of you remember a few years ago when David Robinson was the great naval uh, officer that was a tremendous basketball player and he was signed by the San Antonio Spurs, the professional basketball team? And he went on to become the, the Spurs' most valuable player and leading scorer. But then the Spurs had an opportunity for a number one draft pick. And when they did, they chose from Wake Forest University, Tim Duncan. And immediately there was murmuring in the press corps, David Robinson versus Tim Duncan, who's going to be the star? But then right from the very beginning, David Robinson said, this kid is the heir apparent. This kid is the future of this franchise, and he's going to be on this team, and I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass the ball to him because he's a tremendous player. You just watch him. And Tim Duncan went on to become the league's most valuable player, and David Robinson and Tim Duncan both were able to win a couple of world championship rings. Why? Because David Robinson knew how to play second fiddle. He knew how to pass the ball and make that other player look great. You know, there's really not a whole lot of this thing called humility in our society. People in our companies, society are trying to push everybody down. Politicians putting everybody down. Where in the world is humility. Where are the people who's, who, in whose care God can entrust power in this world? Characteristic number one, people who play second fiddle are in tune with themselves. They love themselves, not with a false sense of modesty or with a chip on their shoulder, but with a healthy sense of self-esteem. Characteristic number two, 
People who can play second fiddle are in tune with the people around them. Now, the Apostle Paul says right there in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, look not only to your own interests, but also in the interests of others. I usually get here to the church pretty early on Sunday mornings, and one Sunday morning I was looking for a cup, a glass of ice, and I couldn't find one around, but I, I, I did find Robert, who is our custodian facility person that's here usually bright and early in the mornings. And so I asked him about a cup, and Robert said, listen, I'll go find you one. I, I've got one stop to make, and I'll be back in just a minute. And I went to my office, and I began working on the Sunday sermon. And in just a few minutes, there was a knock on my door, and I opened it, and there was Robert with this wonderful cup and glass of ice water. And then he said to me, he said, he said Chuck, I didn't want you to, to be preaching this morning without a good glass of cold water. And even though that was just such a simple thing to do, and it only took Robert just a few minutes to do it, that meant so much to me. And I remember thinking through the day, I had a spring in my step, and I had this ice-cold water in my stomach, and the day was a better one because of his little action of kindness. I talk to people all week long that little actions of kindness make a, such a difference. Like uh, someone told me this past week about an email they received and someone took the time to send them a note of encouragement. My friend, your friend, Margie Fantasek, sitting down here right on the second row, sends to many of us notes and cards and letters, handwritten that just brighten our day week after week after week. Thank you, Margie, for doing that. Sometimes I hear from people about staff members who left a message on someone's voicemail on it. And the person just tells me it just made their day. It only took a minute to do, but it just made their day because that person, maybe that staff person, was looking only to the interests of others. We've got a ministry in our church called Home to Home, and they're looking to the interest of others. They're an amazing group of people that are picking up and delivering furniture week after week after week all over this community. We've got, we've got persons in this church that take hours and hours knitting blankets for, uh, for little children that are going to be baptized like just in the 11 o'clock hour today. And we get all kinds of notes from people telling us how meaningful that is. And these kinds of things only happen because people like you thought not only of their own interests, but of the interest of others. So be very sure this morning, friends, knowing that people who play second fiddle are not only in tune with themselves, but people who play second fiddle are in tune with God. Characteristic number three, people who play second fiddle are in tune not just with themselves, in tune not just with the people around them, but thirdly, finally, in tune with God, deeply with God. I love how Philippians 2, written by the Apostle Paul, puts it, have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not a grant equality with God a thing to be grasped, but laid aside in the sense the prerogatives of deity. And he took the form of a servant and was obedient, even unto death on a cross. Jesus Christ could have clutched and in clinging to all the prerogatives of divinity, but he set them aside and became a humble sacrificial servant, not begrudgingly because he had to. He did it willingly, voluntarily for us. So, people who follow Jesus are called to play second fiddle. And we should see them and they should see us this quality of being in tune with God. 
You know, I see that quality in particular in one of our former presidents of the United States, Jimmy Carter. I've seen it through the years in his work with one of the great organizations, nonprofits in this country called Habitat for Humanity. He's worked together with them at building countless homes all over this country. And typically, you know this, when, when former presidents of the United States come to a major city, they stay in the nicest hotel in town, but not James Earl Carter. A few years back, when he, when he went to New York City, he stayed at the Harlem YMCA. And that gesture alone says a great deal about the character of Jimmy Carter and more about the humility than could ever be written in words. I remember years ago right here in Charlotte, James and Rosalind Carter came to Charlotte for a, a big Habitat Blitz here in this city. And Carter and his family and friends arrived by bus from Plains, Georgia, and there was a big sign that said, Welcome, President and Mrs. Jimmy Carter. And they went directly to the church, which was going to be their home and for where they would work all through the week on this Habitat project. And I remember the pastor of the church saying, President Carter, we've got a men's dormitory and a women's dormitory over there, but we're not going to have you and Mrs. Carter to stay there. We have a presidential suite for you, and it's all decked out, and you're going to even have your own private bathroom. We've been working on it all week. And with that, he gave President Carter a key. It's yours. And President Carter thanked the pastor humbly and then said, this is such a great honor that you've given me and I'm grateful, but may I just tell you about a young couple who was on the bus with us from Plains and we got to talking with them and we found out that they were married just yesterday and they're on their honeymoon with us and they've used their honeymoon money to come on this habitat trip to build a homes for the poor. So would you please allow me to let this wonderful young couple turn the presidential suite into the honeymoon suite? And everybody cheered. You see, Jimmy Carter set aside the prerogatives of the office. A former president of the United States he has the right to that place, you might say. But he set the right aside. And Jimmy Carter wasn't thinking status. I think Jimmy Carter was thinking kingdom of God. So be very sure, church, people that play second fiddle are in tune with the harmony of God. Let me close with this. Some years ago, near no Yosemite Valley, there in Yosemite, California, there was a terrible car accident. And a young woman was thrown from the car, and friends, she had lacerations from head to foot. Father got out of the car and ran over to her, and his daughter was bleeding, and he wanted to do everything that he could to be able to save his, his daughter's life. And the police were summoned, and a, a, a doctor that was on vacation in the valley was with his family, and he was driving up, and he pulled up, and he went to, to see what he could do, and he offered his services to the father, but he didn't have his bag of instruments. He couldn't do everything that he would normally be able to do. And the father was saying to him, you've got to do something to help my daughter. And the doctor replied saying, believe me, I, 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 I'm doing everything I can, but, but my problem is, is that I, I don't have enough instruments. And the father grabbed the doctor and said, listen, this is my daughter. She's going to die if you don't do something. Will you just get with it? And the doctor, with tears in his face, turned to the father and said, Look, I want to help. I'm doing everything I can, but I need more instruments. 
Have you ever shaken your fist at God and said, God, why are the Israelis and the Palestinians killing each other? Why don't you do something, God? God, why is there so much racial injustice in the land? Why don't you do something? God, why are are there so many people on the margins and there's so many in poverty? God, why don't you do something? God, why are there so many mass killings in this country? Why don't you do something? And maybe God looks at us with tears in his eyes and God says, I want to help, but I need more instruments. You, my friends, are the instruments of God. And if this morning you will begin to allow God to play with your life, that the maestro, that Jesus, to play with your life, then you will find God's will in some mysterious sort of way begin to transform your second fiddle into the most glorious first chair violin that you've ever heard. It's the harmony of heaven. Can you hear it? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand please as you're able? As we worship God, and as we prepare to go forth into the world. step, Lord, will you carry me? When I've lost my fight, will you be my strength? Will you set me a table in the presence of my enemies? I shall not want, I shall not want. Oh, my soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not want, I shall not want, I shall not want. Cause my cup's running over, running over, and I shall not want. I will lift my eyes where my help comes from. And I won't be afraid of the shadow Cause I've seen the sun No, I will not stop When the way gets hard Cause the green only grows in the valley And that's where you are I shall not want I shall not want I shall not want Oh, my soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not want. I shall not want. I shall not want. Cause my cup's running over, running over, and I shall not
There's a mansion in glory and you're gonna meet me there. I shall not want. I shall not want. Wipe away every tear. I shall not want. See. I shall not want. I shall not want. I'll be home in the presence forever. I shall not want. For the Lord is my shepherd. When I'm drowning, the Lord is my shepherd. Up on the mountain, yes, the Lord is my shepherd. Oh, my Lord is my shepherd in the valley, and I shall not want. And now, people of God, let's go into the world to love God and to love like God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. We're grateful that you're here with us at Matthews United Methodist, and we hope you feel deeply blessed by our time together. We invite you to join us again next Sunday on Facebook or YouTube or in one of our many services. Be sure to connect with our life-changing ministries on our website as well. Thanks.